Well, it's very, I'll start a little bit before that because sure. it's been very, a very strange few years. You know, before I had a public sort of online presence where it was just a, a Twitter account where I was like, hey guys, I'm in this show, come and see me and yada, yada, yada. Yeah. And of course, yeah. no one cared about that. And, but I also had this anonymous Twitter account where I just, I shared my true opinions. But in 2020, things were just so uproarious. And I said, you know what, forget it, man. I have to speak out and say something. And so it was really interesting because I noticed that between me genuinely saying what I think and, uh, you know, and meeting the right people, being on the right shows, somehow, some way over the past few years, I've been able to build this pretty sizable following. I call myself an accidental influencer. I mean, I never asked for any of this. And so I think that kind of laid the foundation to, in terms of getting, you know, getting me more known, getting my face out there. Mm -hmm. And so then on top of all of that, I said, you know, I, I had this idea that I've nestled for a few years now. And whenever I spoke to anybody about it, they would say, oh my God, you Clifton, you have to do it. That's, that's an amazing idea. I have a friend who said that that's a million dollar idea. You have to go for it. It was inspired uh, in part by seeing uh, shows like there's a show called Thurgood, which Lawrence Fishburne did a few years ago, about 10 years ago, actually, about Thurgood Marshall. It's a one man show. There's another show called, um, I saw a show in New York called Satchmo at the Waldorf, which is a one man play about uh, Louis Armstrong. Mm hmm. And uh, way back in 1977, the great James Earl Jones did a play called Robeson about the uh, actor and athlete and activist Paul Robeson, another one-man play. And so I was just like, you know, who, who would make a great subject for a one-person show that, that I could create myself? And um, naturally, I just like, well, Thomas Sowell. Mm -hmm. It seems like Thomas Sowell is like, he's criminally... Um, unknown. It's not, a, it's not a, he's not, you know, you'd never see him in, uh, or a show about him in our traditional theater institutions and industries. And um, he's become a very monumental figure. And it just seems like it was a no brainer to me. You know what I mean? So I, my good colleague, Tom Woods, just, you know, pushed me and said, let's, you know, just let's do this thing, man. Like, get it off the yeah, ground. You know, he was I, so excited about it. And um, he pushed me, pushed me. And I created this crowdfunding campaign on Indiegogo. Um, well, Cliff, let me just stop your second. Yeah. I think probably most of our audience knows who he is, but can you just speak a little bit? Like, who is Thomas Sowell in case somebody's like, I don't know who that is? Yeah, so Tom Sowell is, uh, you know, an economist, a philosopher in some cases, a historian, but he's a black man who was born in Jim Crow South. And uh, he spent the first part of his life as a diehard Marxist. And uh, then even after studying with the great economist Milton Friedman, he was still a diehard Marxist. But then it was working for the government that ended up changing his mind. And so now, what, 45 books, thousands of articles later, he is one of, maybe one of America's best kept secrets in terms of thinkers and philosophers and economists. He certainly, his work certainly changed my life when I encountered it. And, um, you know, I'm reading his story now, his memoirs, and um, there are interesting parallels between his life and mine in terms of our sort of ideological journey. So for those who don't know who he is, that is uh, that is Thomas Sowell in a nutshell. Yeah, just to give a little more flip. So like I, he came on my radar. I used to listen to Rush Limbaugh when I was like, that's kind of what got me politically act active when I was in high school. My dad listened to him in the car. And then when Rush would sometimes let Walter Williams host the show when Rush was on vacation and Walter Williams would then, when he was the host of you know Rush Limbaugh's show for that day, would often bring on Thomas Sowell as a special guest for, you know, 20 minutes and they talk about stuff. And so over the years, yeah, Sowell has kind of just blossomed until now. He's like this, this cult figure almost within certain circles of like libertarian conservative types. Like, you know, there's a, I think I follow on Twitter, like a, a Thomas Sowell account that's not him. It just, you know, somebody that just, it just generates Thomas Sowell memes all day. And it's a, you know, fun little thing. And, and yeah, he's just written, as you say, Clifton, a ton on, you know, basic primers on free market economics, but also a lot of like anthropological, cultural studies and things like, like that. So very well-rounded, interesting guy. No, oh, I, I would agree with that. But you would also have to agree that generally speaking, women are paid less, for example, for the same jobs as men. No, I would not. I would not agree with that. If you're talking about women with the same number of years of experience, with the same continuous I, service, et cetera, et cetera. Then when I look at that, I don't find that disparity. I find, for example, in many cases, the women are making more, depending on how you break the data down. The difference with women is between, is between married women and everybody else. That's the real difference. 
Well, even as to single women, the Census Bureau statistics, the most recent ones I could find, 1978, say that single men are earning $11,100 and single women are earning $9,300. Yes, I love love the word single that is used. When I did my study, I didn't use single, I used never married. You see, a woman who is single at age 40, having spent 10 or 20 years raising children, is really not quite the same as a man at age 40 who's been working continuously for 20 years. And and the differential she cited is not that great, so it could easily be accounted for by by, by the... Yes, because when I break them down the other way, I, I did this for the academic world, and there I found the uh, women who are never married, which is the term way I, I take it, uh, there they were earning more than the men. And similarly, when the government did data some years ago on women who had been working continuously since high school into, the thir- into their, their 30s, uh, there you found that they were making slightly more than men of the same description. Well, you know, he, he, a lot of his work, the scope of his work, it really covers like just the, the human condition in a really, in a really interesting way. And... Um, you know, but it's funny because he's enjoying a bit of a renaissance right now in terms of popularity. You can go to YouTube right now and you can find videos of like young people watching his videos and reacting to them and saying, oh my God, like I, this guy makes sense. How come I've never heard of him before? So it's really interesting now that, you know, as he, you know, he's 90, almost 94 years old and uh, sort of looking at the last phase of his life, but he's enjoying this sort of blossoming interest, which I think is just, you know, kind of poetic in a way. Yeah, maybe we, it, well, around here we will have inserted a clip or something just for in case the, the people watching the video just to get us a, a sense of, yeah, he's a very compelling uh, guy. Okay, so so now you're, you're, what's your project idea since I interrupted you? Yeah, so it's just a, a, a one-man show about the man, the myth, and the legend. In the process of developing it right now and, and creating the script, and uh, what I don't want for it to be is uh, a straight excuse me, a straight bio play where it's like, oh, you know, like an X axis, kind of like this happened and then this happened and this happened and this happened because you can just go to a documentary or to Wikipedia for that. Mm-hmm. The main goal is to create a, a compelling, exciting piece of theater about a compelling, exciting person. You know, part of it is about who is he, where did he come from and, and what's his trajectory and his story, but it's also about getting underneath the skin of who this person is. It's about exploring uh, the emotional life of this great thinker, which I think is pretty interesting in terms of, you know, the mind and the and the heart and the soul, if you will. You know, and I mentioned the Satchmo at the Waldorf, the Louis Armstrong show. One of the really um, interesting things about that show was that at certain points, this actor, you know, black actor, obviously, playing Louis Armstrong, he would transform, um, so to speak, into other characters. Uh, namely, one was Miles Davis, which is pretty awesome. But the other was... Um, Armstrong's white manager. And it's always fun to be able to suspend your disbelief as an audience member to see this person transform their essence into a different character. And so with the soul play, you know, you have all kinds of possibilities. I mean, I'm a 6'3", you know, broad-shouldered guy, but can I transform myself into a Walter E. Williams or into a Friedrich Hayek or into a Milton Friedman? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's, It's these kinds of things that that uh, allow for a lot of potential, you know what I mean? And on top of that, there's contrasting souls views with other prominent black voices from, you know, Martin Luther King and Malcolm X to Barack Obama. So, you know, they might show up in the play at a certain point and, you know, through how I alter my voice and my body and my cadence and all these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, so it's, uh, it's an exploration of his ideas and of his story, but also it's a, it's a deep dive into who the person is. And that's where the, your, my training as an actor comes in. It's investigating and exploring, mm-hmm. you know, who was this person? Where did he come from? What makes him tick? What makes him angry? What makes him sad? What is he afraid of? These kinds of sides you don't really get to see. And in a way, I'm interpreting the character of Thomas Sowell as Clifton Duncan. And that's an exciting aspect as well. Yeah, so that and I liked. Um, I think I heard you on Tom Woods' show to talking about that, and you were. You don't have to do it here if you don't want to, but I think you even did your Malcolm X, on that. Oh, did I? I don't remember that, but uh, yeah, no, I won't do it here. Don't but uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but that, that's when you did. That. I realized, like, oh yeah, so this isn't just Clifton 
Like, it's not just Thomas Sowell talking to the audience like, and then when I was 15, I got this for my birthday. And then I did this. And then I read this book. Right. And it's, it's, you know, because it, that, that's just the most boring thing you could ever think of. So, uh-huh. you know, you want to, you want to, reach for what are the most exciting dynamic parts that, that you can pull out. And I mean, I already have, I already know that I don't want the show to be like in a flat proscenium. I'd rather do it in a, in what's called a thrust stage, which is you have an audience in front of you and on, and on the sides. Mm. And it's very, it's way more immersive. And, you know, I mean, there, there's all kinds of things you can do. It's a really, really exciting prospect. But part of that, again, is putting in the work to what, I, like what I want to do ideally is to become so familiar with the character of Thomas Sowell that I can be able to improvise, you mm-hmm. know, in, in character and play in character. That's when you know that you really nailed it. That's the big journey that, that, that we're on right now. Have you ever in your career thus far played a historical person before? Um, I actually played Malcolm X. <laughs> oh, okay. A, um, so maybe that's why, yeah. You, that well, there was a, but I mean, wheelhouse. you know, it was like a, a one day, it was like a, a, a quick guest star on a CBS show, but uh, have mm-hmm. I played anyone? Like, uh, and so it's been so long, I can't remember. Um, I don't think so. But, you know, it, it's interesting because it's a challenge because you don't want to, the trap is falling into mere interpretation, uh, excuse me, um, impressionism right. and mere imitation, you know, because then you become basically like an SNL sketch. Mm-hmm. And there's no there's no depth underneath the surface. It's just very superficial. Oh, okay, he sounds like that like that person, but it's it's like a, it becomes parody basically. Right. What you want to do, I mean, an example I can think of is like um, is Will Smith and Ali. Yeah. Um. You know, like it's Will Smith is capable. You know, when he applies himself, but it came off as more of someone trying to play Muhammad Ali versus oh versus Denzel Washington playing Malcolm X, and you're like to the point where. He was so good in that movie that when I see a picture of Malcolm X today, I see both men. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, Denzel looks nothing like Malcolm, but he found something inside of himself. You know what I mean? He, like, he was able to channel the essence of Malcolm X. That's what's what you want to do as an actor. It's your, you want to find your way into, you know, what are the parts of you that are analogous to the character you're playing? You know, how are they different? How can you make these different aspects, you know, real to you? How can you use yourself, right, to become, the, like, use the aspects of yourself in service of uh, becoming this other person? And that's where the, the fun and the challenge is in that, from that aspect, from that point of view.